Welcome to Chasing the Lost. This podcast discusses mature subject matter, listener discretion is advised. Part 2 of the Thomas Velva case. We covered quite a bit in part 1, and if you haven't listened to that part, please do so before you proceed with this one. The disclaimer for this will remain the same as for part 1. There will be many triggering details that may not be suitable for all listeners. If sensitive topics trigger you, please tune out now. This is the case of Thomas Velva an eight-year-old boy who was failed by the system, as well as the person who was supposed to protect him, his father. Thomas died on January 17th of 2020. His body was removed from the unheated garage that he was forced to sleep in with his older brother, Anthony. Only a few feet away, inside a warm home, were his father, Michael, his fiancée, Angela, her three daughters, as well as Tommy's youngest brother, Andrew. Both Tommy and Anthony were autistic, but Andrew was not. Was this the reason for forcing his older boys to remain in a cold garage, where temperatures would sometimes reach the low teens? What could ever justify such treatment of your own flesh and blood? Everyone wants to know that answer, but it might not be one we ever get to hear straight from Michael's mouth. He's currently on trial for the murder of his son, but that trial is not public, so we're going to rely on witness summaries. Before we begin on that trial, I want to tell you about the actions taken after Tommy's death by his mother, Justina. Justina, who had been fighting for her children for so long through the court system, was finally given her two boys back. But that was never Justina's goal. She wanted all three of her children, not two. She sought justice for years. She contacted police, spoke to judges, teachers, went to CPS. But she was turned away at every turn, and ultimately, she was the one punished not those who were abusing Anthony and Tommy. She only regained custody of her boys after Tommy's death. She sought out therapy for them and some of that has been released due to a filing that Justina has brought against the state, the CPS, and administration at the children's school. What I'm going to do in this part is provide you information from the lawsuit that Justina filed in 2020. The lawsuit contains a lot of detail that's very important to this case. We're gonna get into that right now. On January 17th, 2020, Justina's eight-year-old child, Thomas, froze to death in a garage at the home of his father, Michael Valva after being subjected to years of physical abuse, mental, and sexual abuse by both Valva and his fiancée, Angela Polina. Tommy's death was not only foreseeable, but completely preventable. For over three years leading up to his death, Justina repeatedly warned that her young children, including Tommy and his two siblings, Anthony and Andrew, were being tortured, beaten, physically, mentally, sexually, and starved by both Michael and Angela. Justina provided all of the defendants with overwhelming and irrefutable evidence of abuse, including documentary evidence, audio recordings, transcriptions, photographic evidence, and medical evidence. Justina also provided the defendants with her children's own recorded statements regarding the enormous physical abuse and mental 
that they were suffering at the hands of their father and Angela. Justina specifically warned the defendants her children were in enormous danger of losing their lives. The repeated warnings, the overwhelming evidence, they did nothing. Rather than taking action to protect the children and stop the abuse by their father and his fiance and report the multiple, multiple complaints of abuse as they had been made, as they were required to do under New York State Social Services law, the defendants hid the truth about the children's health, fabricated false, misleading, and dishonest reports about Justina herself. The defendants not only refused to remove Justina's children from the custody of Michael and Angela, but also suppressed, destroyed, and falsified evidence, thereby ensuring that Justina's three children would remain in Michael's custody. In doing so, the defendants flagrantly violated their legal duties under New York state law and exhibited a shocking indifference to the health, safety, and welfare of the children. As a result of the defendant's neglect, reckless, and intentional acts of misconduct, as set forth above, Justina's eight-year-old son, Tommy, a special needs child on the autism spectrum disorder, who was otherwise a very happy child under Justina's care, before Michael unlawfully gained temporary custody over him, in September of 2017, died of hypothermia in January 2020. The origins of Tommy's death can be traced back to a miscarriage of justice which took place on September 6, 2017, when Justice Hope Schwartz Zimmerman unlawfully and without any due process whatsoever summarily took away the plaintiff's children gave temporary custody of them to Michael. Judge Zimmerman did this by issuing a grossly improper and illegal temporary full stay away order of protection against Justina. This will be detailed. Judge Zimmerman's unlawful decision was set in motion by Michael and his attorney, another defendant, Shanna Curdy Esquire, two months earlier and was brought to fruition with the act of aid and assistance and encouragement of another defendant, Donna McCabe Esquire, the attorney for the children. In the summer of 2017, Shana Curdy, together with McCabe, willfully conspired with Michael Valva, whom Curdy was representing in the divorce proceedings, to fabricate abuse claims against Justina and thereby help Velva gain substantial benefits in the divorce case, such as custody of the children, as well as sole possession of the marital residence. This was done to completely destroy Justina. In furtherance of this conspiracy, Curdy sent a letter dated July 7, 2017 to the United Mortgage Corporation in which she stated, without any lawful basis for making such a claim, that Justina would lose custody of her children and that Michael would be granted full and exclusive custody of the children. In this letter, Curdy wrote, based off of the current situation, Mr. Valva will be receiving close to 100% custody of his three children. She might be entitled to visits. Thus, Defendant Curdy, as the attorney for Michael Valva, already knew two months prior to the issuance of the temporary custody order dated on 9-6 of 17, that the Nassau County Supreme Judge Zimmerman was going to unlawfully and immediately take the plaintiff's three children away from her. She did this by issuing a temporary full stay away order of protection that was never recorded in the court's minutes during the court appearance on September 6th, nor was it recorded in the Department of Justice Registry or the Police Registry. The reason why Curdy seemed to know that Valva would receive 100% custody of her three children was because that she knew what Valva was planning with Curdy and McCabe's 
full knowledge, consent, and assistance. They were going to make false allegations of child abuse against Justina with the Suffolk County Child Protective Services Bureau. This would help justify the unlawful removal of the children, and it worked. As Michael's attorney, Curdy, learned of highly irregular financial transactions that Curdy knew or should have known were a clear indication that Valva was engaged in criminal activities and or had unlawful sources of income that brought in very large sums of money that were far in excess of what he was actually being paid as an NYPD police officer. Valva's bank statements, in which Curdy had in her possession, in which she used to get a new mortgage for Valva, showed enormously high bank deposits on Valva and Polina's accounts from unknown sources. They ranged between $30,000 to $130,000 per month. This was a clear sign that Valva and or Polina, who was unemployed, were engaged in some type of unlawful activity that was generating a substantial amount of income. Curdy turned a blind eye, made no disclosures to the authorities of these transactions, Instead, she continuously accepted payment for Michael in order to further his plan. In furtherance of this unlawful plan, on August 31st of 2017, Curdy filed an order to show cause to change parental custody rights. This order was rife with blatant lies, misrepresentations, and material omissions of fact. On the same day, Justina also filed an order to show cause, seeking a temporary restraining order asking for custody over Justina's children. She was becoming increasingly concerned over their health, safety, and welfare. She knew something was happening in the presence of Michael and Angela. On September 6th of 2017, an appearance was held before Judge Zimmerman, who was presiding over the divorce proceedings between the plaintiff and Michael. No hearing was scheduled for that day, nor was any oral argument scheduled. In fact, neither Curdy nor Justina's lawyers had been fully briefed, and nothing had been submitted to the court but oppositional papers were still due on both motions. At the outset of the court appearance, Zimmerman stated on the record, quote, I'm not going to do anything today, end quote. Rather, the purpose of this appearance was simply to set a schedule for the remaining briefings of the parties, respective to the orders to show cause. Notwithstanding this statement on the record, Zimmerman would soon make a catastrophic decision regarding Justina's custody rights at this very conference. This sudden change in the court's position was due to outright lies and misrepresentations made by McCabe and Curdy. At the behest of Defendant Curdy, Defendant Donna McCabe, who was a close personal friend of Curdy's and or had professional dealings with her, and was also very friendly with Michael, made several false, misleading, and dishonest statements to the court regarding Justina, and or urged the court to change parental custody to Michael, helping further hatch his plan. Curdy also appeared at this conference and likewise made several material false and misleading statements. Justina had provided the court with a flash drive containing over 400 files of evidence pertaining to the abuse of the children by Michael and Angela. The judge completely ignored this evidence. Despite the fact that Zimmerman had said at the outset of the appearance she was not going to do anything today, McCabe nonetheless implored the court to take the children away from Justina and give them to Michael telling the court, quote, 
I believe it is time for this court to make a change in custody at this point. End quote. McCabe set in motion the tragic chain of events that would ultimately lead to Tommy's death and would lead to the severe physical, mental, and sexual abuse of all three of the boys. In support of this unlawful request, McCabe, acting more like a second attorney for Michael than an advocate for the children, told the court falsely that Valva has, quote, had very limited time with his children, and there have been no weekend visitations, and that there have been no holiday, holiday visitations, end quote. What McCabe failed to disclose was the fact that Michael had, in fact, failed to show up for his visitation 29 different times, as documented by Justina and given to McCabe. She never reported that to the judge. McCabe knew that the initial judge, Fran Ricliano, who had previously barred Velva from overnight visits, after reviewing a large amount of evidence and files and documents of his disturbing behavior, including Michael taking pictures of his private parts and sending them to other women while he was putting the kids to bed and they were still awake. McCabe told the court falsely that Justina had made up stories about her boys crying after being secretly interviewed by McCabe in her office. In fact, the boys were visibly upset and crying after being grilled by McCabe in her office. This ex parte interview of the children was in clear violation of the court's directives, which had required that any such visits be on notice to Justina. In any event, what McCabe represented to the court was an outright, outright lie. The boys were extremely fearful and intimidated by their lawyer, McCabe, and did not want to go back to see her again. McCabe further told the court falsely that Justina had been non-compliant with a court-ordered forensic evaluation of the children by Dr. Peter Favaro. In fact, Justina had been fully compliant, but again had requested that the evaluations be videotaped. For that reason, the request was, as confirmed by audio recordings and certified transcripts, Valva and Polina had been repeatedly steadfast in attempting to brainwash the children, teaching them to say false and hateful things about their mother whenever the children would come over to visit them. The two older children were especially vulnerable to this type of brainwashing since they both had autism and could be easily manipulated as a result. Justina had previously signed a consent form allowing Dr. Favaro to evaluate her children and to videotape the evaluation. Specifically, on December 2nd of 2016, Justina had signed the informed consent to participate in a custody evaluation with Dr. Favaro and or the company Smart Parenting. Justina was not refusing to have the children examined. Rather, she was asking for them to videotape it. In presenting the court with these lies, McCabe improperly vouched for herself as an advocate, telling the court, quote, your honor has known me for a long time, end quote, thereby attempting to bolster her credibility and lend support to her completely baseless claims. McCabe lied to the court not only to promote the unlawful plan of Curdy and Valva, but also to retaliate against Justina for having recently filed a motion to remove McCabe as the AFC in the case. Specifically, on August 21st of 2017, Justina had filed a motion with the Nashaw County Supreme Court asking the court to remove Donna McCabe as the children's AFC. In this motion, Justina highlighted the fact that McCabe, in violation of her duties as the AFC, consistently acted as Valva's second attorney, repeatedly arguing on his behalf 
protecting his interests instead of protecting the interest of the children. Justina also pointed out that she had furnished McCabe with the audio recordings pertaining to Michael and Angela's brainwashing of the children, teaching the children to repeat hateful and false allegations. McCabe never presented that at court. Instead of disclosing the evidence of abuse, which she is lawfully required to do as the AFC for the children, McCabe fabricated evidence against Justina and accused her of misconduct and requested the court take the children away. Shockingly, without any notice, without any formal court accusation of wrongdoing against Justina, without any family offense petition filed against Justina, without any hearing, and without any supporting evidence, on September 6th, Judge Zimmerman immediately took away Justina's custody of her children. She issued a temporary full stay away order of protection against her that was never recorded in the court's minutes, the Department of Justice Registry, or the Police Registry. Zimmerman's actions were unlawful, unconstitutional, and a violation of Justina's due process rights. Moreover, Judge Zimmerman's summary removal of the plaintiff's children was a clear violation of the Family Court Act, which sets for the mandatory conditions which must be met before the children can lawfully be removed from a parent's custody based on an alleged neglect. Judge Zimmerman unlawfully ordered the children to be taken away immediately. Children who had been under her Justina's care since they were born. She was going to be denied any contact with her children. For six months, this order would prohibit Justina from contacting her kids and their special needs education placements that they had been attending for a few years. Zimmerman not only took the children away from their mother, but removed them from their medically necessary special education placement. The same day after the court appearance, the Nassau County Police from the 5th Precinct, who were close friends of Michael's, came to Justina's house to remove the children based on this full stay away law or protection order issued by Zimmerman. Justina wasn't even allowed to say goodbye to Tommy since he was picked up directly by his father from the school bus that day. Judge Ricliano, who was the first judge in the divorce proceedings, after reviewing the evidence, had felt strongly enough that Michael was in violation of things to not even let the children stay overnight. That was evidence and proof, and the judge made a determination. In this case, there was no evidence in order to prove that Justina was doing something to harm the children. In rewarding the immediate custody to Michael, Judge Zimmerman, just like McCabe, failed and refused to consider the clear evidence of Michael's abuse of the children. Again, there was the flash drive provided to Zimmerman containing a couple of hundred files that showed physical, mental, and sexual abuse of her children. Zimmerman did not examine the evidence before she issued her ruling. On September 20th of 2017, Zimmerman did modify the temporary, temporary full stay away order of protection from September 6th. She allowed Justina unsupervised visitation, but still kept the stay away conditions regarding the children's place of living and their school. This order, just like the original, was not recorded in any minutes, not included in the Department of Justice Registry or Police Registry. It was, for all intents and purposes, completely fictional. They never did find a lawful basis for remo removing the children from Justina. Additionally, Judge Zimmerman 
is a judge presiding over the matrimonial proceedings. She had no authority to make such a ruling. Typically, such an act can only be made by the family court judge. Pursuant to the Family Court Act, upon proper notice, a petition, and a hearing. None of those things happened. On October 31st of 2017, CPS investigator Michelle Clark became involved with the case. She received a call alleging that Justina was abusing the children. From the outset, it should have been obvious that Michael's claims of abuse were fabrications, but Miss Clark did visit Tommy and Anthony at their school on November 1st of 2017. Tommy at that time was six, told Miss Clark he had no concerns at all. Anthony at that time was eight and likewise told Clark that he had no concerns at all about visiting with his mother. He said he was never physically abused, he had not ever been punished, and he was not afraid of her. Simply put, Clark never observed or heard anything that could verify or corroborate Michael's claims. There was no evidence whatsoever to support any claim. Had Clark done the bare minimum of an investigation, she would have realized that it was Michael who was in the middle, middle of a bitter matrimonial dispute manufacturing these fantastic tales of abuse so he would get custody of his children. The irony in all of this is that the children were not being abused by their mother, but rather actively abused at the time by Michael and Angela. Justina repeatedly tried to alert CPS to this abuse. There were many separate CPS reports filed, including on November 7th, 2017, January 2nd, 2018, January 14th, 2018. In these reports, Justina desperately tried to alert CPS to the shocking evidence of abuse, torture, beating, and starvation of the children. In the first CPS report, November 7th, 2017. Justina informed CPS about her children's severe weight loss and starvation while living in their father's home. In one month, Anthony, who was eight years old, had lost 13 pounds. In that same period, Tommy, who was six years old, had lost four and a half pounds. Andrew, who was four, had lost three and a half pounds. Additionally, in the November report, Justina reported that Michael and Angela were beating the children on their heads, hands, backs, putting the children in extremely long timeouts without food or drink, and making them stay out in the backyard with no shoes. After filing that report, she tried to follow up on the 13th of November, on December 1st, she called the CPS hotline. She was very concerned that her initial report dated November 7th was not being investigated. At the time, Justina wasn't aware that CPS caseworker Michelle Clark and her supervisor Edward Heap had literally done no investigation pertaining to Justina's report. In fact, she later learned that according to the state central register database, her first report, dated November 7th, was marked closed after just two days. Both defendants, Clark and Heap, with the express knowledge and consent of their supervisor, Assistant Director Robert Leto, decided to close out the November 7th report without any investigation, without making any effort to see if the children were in fact being abused. On December 19th of 2017, Justina met in person with the CPS caseworker, Michelle Clark. Two of Clark's supervisors, Heap and the director, Leto, were present. During the meeting, Justina repeatedly and emphatically told the CPS defendants about Michael and Angela's abuse and starvation of the children. She implored them to investigate and take action. 
She explained to them that Tommy and Anthony were losing weight ever since they went to live with their father, that their educational needs were not being met, and the father was leaving the children outside in the cold as a form of discipline. She didn't just rely on her own words to convince CPS. Instead, she provided them with proof and evidence. Specifically, at that meeting, she provided them with a flash drive containing 320 files of direct evidence of abuse of her children. She also provided them with certified transcripts of the audio recordings. Apart from the evidence of abuse, the transcripts confirmed that Michael and Angela were trying to brainwash the children, alienating them, forcing the kids to repeat extremely hateful and false allegations as we listened to in part one of this. There were other things on the recordings that we hadn't listened to, such as the children being told to tell their mother she was a loser and needed to get a job. Apart from confirming the abuse and brainwashing of the children by Valva and Polina, the recordings also contained evidence which conclusively refuted the false abuse charges made by Michael, and which demonstrated beyond question that Justine was a loving and caring mother who had a very special relationship with her children. There were also letters from the children's pediatricians, a neuropsychologist, both who are specialists who work with kids with autism, both who confirmed that Justina was in every respect a loving, caring, and devoted parent, and there were zero signs that she was abusing her children. It also contained a letter from Dr. Kimberly Barron's PhD, who was the supervisor of Anthony's behavioral treatment at Fit Learning in Manhattan. Dr. Barron's wrote, quote, I am completely shocked and saddened by the removal of Justina Valva's children from her custody, along with the order of protection that was issued against her. In the two years that I have known her, I have only seen the most devoted and loving mother attempting to do everything possible for her children. Anthony adores his mother. I've never observed any evidence of abuse or maltreatment that will lead a judge to remove a child from his mother and issue an order preventing the mother from even seeing her child. Nothing about this ruling is in the best interest of Anthony or his siblings. It is highly likely that this ruling will create regression as well as extreme psychological and emotional distress for all of the children. And I cannot imagine any scenario that would justify this course of events. End of letter. Dr. Behrens also documented the fact that Michael had been touching Anthony's bottom. Dr. Behrens, as a mandatory reporter, called the CPS hotline and filed a report regarding this improper touching. Flash drive also contained the children's progress reports and medical evaluation. Went on to document that the kids were happy and joyful when they were with their mother, giving her hugs and kisses and telling her that they loved her and missed her. By contrast, the children were afraid to go on visitations with their father. After visitations, the children were very nervous. They were stressed out and frightened. The children began wetting themselves at night, very often at that point, and they were having nightmares. During the December 19th meeting with CPS, Justina informed them that in 2016, she'd made a report of sexual abuse by Michael and Angela to the police as well as the FBI. She also told them that she had filed another report of sexual abuse against them on July 30th of 2016. These reports documented the following acts of sexual, sexual abuse against the children. Valva would order the children to lick the girls below their belly buttons and touch private parts. He would order the children to strip naked and walk around without clothing. They would walk around the house naked. That Angela's daughters would also walk around naked. I want to stop for a note on this. 
that one of the groups that I am in on Facebook, the parents of one of the girls, is denying that. The father says that the girl denies that ever happening. Continuing on with December 19th, CPS defendants failed to take any action. They did not file a petition against Michael and Angela despite the overwhelming evidence of their abuse and brainwashing of the children. As a result, the abuse continued and it got worse. Justina felt compelled to submit another report on January 2nd, 2018, again regarding all of the information that she had previously stated. But in her January 2nd, 2018 report, again, it was marked close in just one day. This time it was marked closed by Michelle Clark's supervisor with the knowledge and consent of the assistant director. So they basically completely ignored and immediately closed both of Justina's first two reports with no investigation whatsoever. They were able, they say, to bypass this mandatory requirement by marking Justina's reports as duplicates. In fact, they knew that the reports contained separate and distinct allegations. Tommy ended up paying a severe price for the gross negligence and reckless disregard that these defendants from CPS took. On January 13th, 2018, Tommy was brutally and severely beaten and assaulted by his father. This assault caused visible physical injuries on his buttocks, blood spots, bruises in red, yellow, green, black, and blue, dark red marks, and broken blood vessels. Again, Justina filed a report with CPS. On that day, during her court-ordered visitation with the children, Justina noticed severe physical injuries on Tommy. She reported this. She could not believe that Michael had beaten him so severely, especially after she just provided CPS with clear evidence of abuse. This told her that her complaints were not being investigated. If so, they would have seen the signs of abuse. After seeing all of this, Justina called her neighbor, a lady named Kathy, <clears throat> to independently verify the injuries. Tommy said his father hit him 12 times with his hand because Tommy had complained that Daddy and Angela were hitting him too much and putting him on long timeouts. After this beating, Tommy went back on a long timeout with no food and no drink. As soon as Justina dropped Tommy off and returned home, she called CPS to file the report. The following day, January 15th, Michael refused to produce the children for Justina's court-ordered visitation. Even though Michael had sent Justina a text and confirmed that he and the children were, in fact, at home at that time. During the period of time that Justina was waiting to see the kids, another CPS worker, Mr. Ron Meha, arrived on the scene regarding Justina's CPS report. Meha knocked on the door, rang the bell, but Michael refused to open the door. Michael did not want CPS to see with their own eyes the severe physical injuries that had been inflicted on Tommy. Rather than just calling the police himself, Meha placed the burden on Justina to contact the police. Specifically, Meha instructed her to proceed with the Suffolk County Police Department, 7th Precinct, and just file a report. So she did. However, after learning that Michael was a police officer, they looked the other way and did nothing. They refused to even send over a patrol car to check on the well-being of the boys. They refused to take any action to have Michael produce the children for the court-ordered visitation. 
on January 16th, 2018, Justina left a voicemail on Michelle Clark's phone informing her that she would be filing a complaint against her for conducting her CPS investigation in an extremely partial, biased, and unfair manner. She further stated that it was Clark who was responsible for the severe beating and assault of her son Tommy by Michael. After learning of Justina's intention to file the complaint against her, Michelle launched, launched a preemptive strike and filed a malicious and baseless neglect pre-petition against Justina on January 17th under Family Court Act 1029, requesting an order of protection for Justina to stay away from her children. Shortly after, the CPS defendants filed a formal child neglect petition against Justina, which falsely accused her of neglecting the children. Among other things, it alleged that Justina had neglected her children by using excessive corporal punishment and that her impaired mental health placed the children in imminent harm, risk of harm. They knew that these, all of these allegations were false and misleading, but she was getting revenge for the complaint that was about to be lodged against her. Clark's claim that she believed that Justina posed a danger to the safety of the children was just a blatant fabrication. In fact, Clark had previously represented on multiple CPS reports that Justina posed no danger whatsoever to the children. Specifically, she had affirmatively stated on the Central Register reports dated October 31st, 2018, November 7th, 2017, November 13th, 17, January 8th, 18, January 15th, 18, that there were no safety concerns that placed the children in any danger of harm in regards to their mother. Also, Clark knew that it was Michael who was physically abusing the children. She concealed as much when she filed on the same day a neglect pre-petition against Michael for severely beating up Tommy. Clark's filing of this petition confirmed she in fact knew that Michael was the one abusing the children. Yet again, they did nothing. She wanted to protect herself and cover up for the immense failures as a CPS investigator and CPS in general when it comes to this case. The day of this hearing comes. This is January 17th, 2018, and Michelle Clark makes her appearance in Suffolk County Family Court. Justina was not present as she did not get sufficient notice. In fact, Justina only found out about the conference from a notice of intent to apply for a court order that was posted on her door the same day the conference was being held. During the initial conference, Michelle used this opportunity to request from the court the temporary full stay away order of protection. She lied about the plaintiff and the alleged dangers that she was posing to her children. She willfully and deliberately hid the truth from the court about critical evidence that she had in her possession. Her effort to deceive the court was successful without Justina having a chance to defend herself since she was not even present, the court did issue a temporary full stay away order of protection against Justina, barring her from having any unsupervised contact with her children. On January 23rd, Michelle filed a full formal neglect petition. Again, it was full of lies and false claims. There was no evidence to support the claims whatsoever. But some of the things that she put on there were excessive corporal punishment, impaired mental state. She's hindering her ability to provide the children with adequate care and supervision. That she demonstrates erratic behavior. The children are afraid of her. That she posed a risk for the safety of said children, since she's allowed to carry a gun 
and her impaired mental state heightens the risk of danger to the children. All of these things were heard, and there was another court appearance at the very end of January. Michelle doubled down and claimed that the Justina was mentally ill and her mental health issues were getting worse in the past few months when her children had been taken away by Judge Zimmerman. She made all of these claims with full knowledge, consent, and encouragement from her higher-ups. Clark would later admit that she had no knowledge whatsoever of any psychi psychiatric, psychological, or mental health disorders afflicting Justina because no such orders ever existed. In order to work as a corrections officer in New York City, Justina was required to undergo comprehensive psychiatric and psychological testing before she could become employed. So there was clearly no evidence that she suffered from any psychiatric disorder or health disorder of any kind. In a failed attempt to bolster her fabricated claims regarding Justina's mental health, Clark contacted Kimberly Behrens, who had supervised Anthony's intensive behavioral treatment at Fit Learning, to ask her about Justina's behavior and mental health, although Dr. Behrens was not Justina's doctor. Dr. Behrens would later testify that she found Michelle's questions odd because, as she had explained, Justina had always acted completely appropriately. She never saw her act in any way but warm, loving, and caring towards her children. She never heard her speak about the father in a derogatory manner while the children were around. She tried to explain this, but at this point, Michelle is desperate to make Justina look terrible. I know by this point, you're going to be thinking, how could all of this be lies? There are so many things that that are being done. Is the whole system corrupt? This is going to further that. In February of 2018, Michelle Clark was replaced by a, another CPS worker, Lance, L-A-N-T-Z, Lance, who was supervised by a June Johnson, and then by another defendant, in this case, Estrada, who was supervised by defendant Heap. Here we go with them. Just as Clark had done, Lance and Estrada repeatedly said the same things. They had very little communication with Justina as of this point. However, the things that they said were, Justina's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic and concerning. She had exhibited a recent history of violence and was out of control. She was consistently uncooperative and unmanageable when dealing with authority, and she has a drinking problem. These falsehoods, as well as many others, were contained in Lance and Estrada's CPS reports. There was no basis, of course, for any of this because none of these defendants had ever even spoken to Justina, never mind had met her in person. There was no medical evidence nor in-person evidence. So they continued on with their reports after taking over that the living environment in Michael's home was stable and provided good to excellent living conditions. Michael was very affectionate to all of the children. He used discipline for the children's age, development, and, con <clears throat> and conduct. He provided age-appropriate care and supervision of the children. He accepts responsibility for problematic behaviors and conditions and has taken appropriate steps to change. In short, Michael is a very good father and there are no concerns whatsoever about the children's health or safety. Finally, they all go to court and Judge Chang is presiding over what is happening. So Judge Chang ends up discussing that this is not 
the appropriate way to make such claims in a child neglect petition. He says, quote, these allegations are more commonly seen in child custody cases, end quote. Simply put, there was no lawful basis for including such allegations in a child neglect petition. The allegations that he was speaking of were that, again, they continued to make claims about Justina's mental illnesses, which they had no evidence of. So this goes on, the hearing is had, but at some point it is ordered that a new representative is put in charge of the case. And it turns out to be AFC Halpern. But AFC Halpern never bothered to do any, not even one time over the next several months, meet with the children. Although all of the evidence, all of the complaints prior had been provided to Halpern. Halperin turned a blind eye, blind eye to all of this and focused on protecting the rights of Michael Valva, making sure that the neglect petition would continue. Toward this end, Halperin submitted a false and misleading affirmation in opposition to Justina's motion to dismiss the negligent petition. And this affirmation dated February 20th, 2018. Halperin falsely stated under penalty of perjury, that the plaintiff herself admitted to hitting the children. Halpern knew that Justina had never made such an admission in court or anywhere else. And Justina never used corporal punishment against her children. But Justice Chang, the decision was to deny Justina's motion to, to dismiss this because these things kept coming up. And of course, at this point, it had to have been extremely frustrating and confusing to Justina on why time after time, every CPS worker who was assigned to the case seemed to have this in their mind that they were going to help Michael while hurting Justina. And nobody was thinking about the children. Nobody at all. Halpern knew that Michael had beaten Tommy in January of 2018. Still, Halpern also did nothing. Halpern did not request from the court to remove the children from Michael's custody, nor did he ask the court for a full stay away order or an order of protection or any restrictions on Michael's custody of the children. Keep in mind, all of these people were supposed to be, their interest was the children and only the children. Yet in almost everything that we've read thus far, it seems like adult personal issues, like tit for tat and back and forth. And through all of this, where in the world were the best interests of the kids? This lawsuit names so many of the people from CPS. Their job is solely to ensure children's safety, not to get into back and forths with parents. But unfortunately, that's all we seem to see in this case. Let's get back to Donna McCabe. If you remember, she was the attorney assigned during the divorce to specifically represent the children. However, she became very involved in the custody battle as well. She went into court and painted this very distorted, inaccurate portrait of the children's very happy lives in Michael's home. She would say things in August of 2018 like, they're all performing well in school, they're all comfortable, and they've assimilated well into the household. They're celebrating the holidays together and enjoy eating. At the same time that she was writing these words, the children were literally being 
mentally, physically, and sexually abused. She was working closely with CPS, as well as others who are named in this order, for whatever reason this may be, to completely undermine anything that Justina tried to do. Whether it was for financial gain or because Justina was so vocal in her methods, she was a bulldog. She never stopped trying to get justice and get her children away from this man and this woman. Things went on in court, and I, I will say that Judge Cheng was really the only judge who seemed to be a bit fair. In April of 2019, Judge Chang found that there was no evidence to support the father's testimony. In reaching this conclusion, Judge Chang explained that he found Mr. Valva's testimony less than credible. His testimony appeared to change when asked for elaboration, and the court found it curious to why neither the father nor Angela took any pictures of the injuries to document the mother's alleged abuse. Further, contrary to the manufactured claims of some of the CPS workers, Judge Chang specifically found no evidence that the mother suffers from mental illness. Judge, Judge Chang noted, the court had the opportunity to observe Justina during the length of this case and during her testimony and found that she was focused, goal-directed, and clear. There seemed to be no evidence presented that she was suffering from mental illness. There was insufficient evidence to show that Justina's mental health was impaired or that her mental health played the children, placed them at any imminent risk of harm. The testimony of other witnesses, like Dr. Behrens and Kathy Izo, the neighbor, provided clear evidence that Justina was in fact a loving, caring, and devoted mother. Judge Chang concluded that, in sum, the record as a whole does not support a finding of neglect. So Judge Chang dismissed the neglect petition. She felt vindicated when she was cleared of the CPS neglect charges. But even though she felt vindicated, these things just didn't end. Also named in the suit is the school that the boys were attending. And while the school did file reports, in her complaint, Justina says the following. In January of 2018, the school defendant saw clear, irrefutable proof that Tommy had been physically beaten and abused by Michael, with severe bruising in his lower spine and buttocks area. Despite seeing this evidence, the school defendants did absolutely nothing to help Tommy or his brothers. In fact, it was not until September 27th of 2018 that the school staff filed its first report. The first CPS report was filed by school psychologist Renee Emmon on the CPS hotline. Thus, for an entire year, from September 2017 to September 2018, no complaints had been filed by the school to help the children. During this time, the school defendants purposely hid the fact that the children were being abused. Further, the school defendants, believing it would reflect poorly on the school, did not instruct the children's teacher or school personnel to call the CPS hotline. By the fall of 2018, Michael and Angela's abuse of the children was so severe that a number of the children's teachers felt compelled, despite the complete absence of rules, regulations, procedures, guidelines, and or directives from the school to file their own complaints with CPS. These complaints were known to CPS and in fact were included in the three court ordered CPS investigations and reports that Justice Cheng ordered CPS to undertake. Specifically, the teachers, Jennifer Hallborough, Jean Rakowski, and Michelle Cogliano, and the school psychologist, Miss Renee Emmon, 
all filed reports with CPS. The children's pediatrician, Susan Walker, and their neurologist, Dr. Bindra, also filed complaints with CPS. As a result of the multiple complaints, CPS was ordered by the court to conduct an investigation. CPS generated an investigation on October 2nd of 2018, October 15th, 18, March 5th of 19, which contained tons of statements from the school's teachers and doctors that confirmed the children were in fact being abused, tortured, and starved. In the CPS report 1034, October 15th, 2018, Defendant Luntz documented the following highly disturbing claims being made by the teachers. Quote, Miss Emmon reports that she and the teachers of Anthony and Thomas are very concerned. The children have lost a noticeable amount of weight, are very thin, and constantly asking for food. End quote. The special education teacher said they had witnessed the children shoving food into their mouths, that Anthony, she is very concerned, he is emaciated. Other teachers go on to say that the children are eating off the floor and out of the garbage, that they come to school and wet pull-ups. They are not allowed to go to the nurse to take it off. They are very concerned. The children are very thin. They have been observed snatching food off the desks and off the floor. Additionally, Dr. Walker had concerns about both of the boys as both of them were underweight and their BMIs being in the one, the first percentile. This goes on to talk about visible bruises that would have been seen by all of the staff on their butts, arms, thighs. They were unexplainable. Anthony had bruises on him and Michael told the school that they were pimples that he was getting on his bottom due to soiling himself. The children often came to school smelling of urine and other things. At one point, one of them came to school and their sneakers were sloshing from the urine inside the shoes. And it seems to me that Michael would blame this on autism, that they picked at themselves and left bruises and they couldn't control their bowel movements because of autism and all of these other things. But the fact was, prior to being with him, these children were completely potty trained. They did not wear pull-ups. They did not pick at their skin. They did not have bruises. They, none of these things were happening whatsoever. And when Michael did come up to the school, he would be very intimidating. When asked to explain things like Anthony coming to school with his clothes and backpack soaked in urine, they failed to address any of the concerns, the parents. They had nothing to say. By November of 18, the children were literally starving to death. Anthony had a BMI of 0.57%. Tommy had a BMI of 1.32%. And Andrew had a BMI of 15%. Still, the school defendants, Principal Snyder, willfully continued to ignore this problem, deny that anything was wrong, and continued to lie to Justina when she would call, saying the children were safe and healthy. And she did call. She wanted to know. She asked the school to please get involved and to help her. But the principal, maybe feeling threatened or intimidated by Michael, simply didn't until they finally couldn't turn a blind eye to it anymore. In one instance, Anthony came to school walking, impaired, bent over at the waist, visible finger marks on his arms, 
complaining that his bottom hurt. The teachers at the school placed ice on his bottom to help stop the enormous pain he was experiencing. There were clear and obvious signs. As mandated reporters, the school should have been reporting all of this. Had they acted in a timely manner, they could have prevented Tommy's death and maybe years of beatings, abuse, and starvation for all three children. On January 8th of 2020, Defendant Jean Montague, as a supervisor of Defendant Lydia Sabosto, decided to unlawfully close out the last CPS report that had been filed on the CPS hotline on November 18th of 2019. This was a disastrous decision. Justina had spoke on the phone twice to Miss Montague and begged her not to close the investigation relating to her children. She reminded Montague of the long history of documented abuse by Michael and Angela, said she was extremely worried about the safety of the kids. Montague ignored Justina, decided to shut it down on January 8th, 2020. Even though the report should have remained open for 60 days pending further investigation, this was the last chance to save Tommy's life. Less than 10 days later, Tommy would be dead. Now we're at the portion of the story where Michael and Angela are being arraigned. Evidence came forward that the couple joked about Thomas's condition on the morning that he died, saying that he, quote, face planted, end quote, to the ground due to cold. At the arraignment, it was revealed that the couple's horrific abuse was partially captured on Nest cameras that had been installed in every room of the house, including the garage. Among other things, the videos were covered by the police despite the couple's attempts to erase them and change the password, showed heartbreaking, incomprehensible events, including Michael beating one of the children with a closed fist while screaming at him, Tommy begging to be let out to use the bathroom, Tommy shivering and shaking in the garage and holding himself because he needed to use the bathroom, looking up into the Nest camera with pleading eyes, for somebody to help him. On the morning of Tommy's death, security footage captured a conversation between Velva and Polina in which she asks him why Tommy fell to the ground. Michael answers in a shocking display of callous and wanton indifference. Quote, Cause he was cold, boo fucking who. Now he's a bloody fucking mess. End quote. They have both been indicted on second-degree murder for Tommy's death. I say that that's not enough, second-degree murder. But in any case, they are currently on trial. I'm going to now read you portions of the medical reviews that were done after Tommy's death of both Anthony and Andrew. As if everything that I've said before this wasn't triggering enough, I'm warning you, what I'm about to read is extremely graphic. They come straight from medical documentation. I am not repeating this for shock value. This is word for word what was written by the doctors. If you cannot handle such content, please pause now or fast forward to the end. July 25th, 2020. Dear Honorable Judge Presiding, Miss Justina Zubko Valva has engaged her sons, Andrew Seven and Anthony Eleven, in psychotherapy with this writer as the children have sustained serious trauma and injury associated with abuse and neglect they sustained in the custody of their father, Michael Valva, and his girlfriend, Angela Polina. Anthony and Andrew have met with this writer on June 4th, 
10th, 17th, 24th, 30th, July 7th, 14th, 18th, 24th, and are scheduled one time weekly for psychotherapy and will be seen again on 7-31-2020. Justina and the children are in need of protection. It is hoped that these sessions can be scheduled twice weekly in September and October to facilitate the emotional processing of this traumatic abuse history. Anthony Valva is an 11-year-old boy born on July 1st of 2009. He is the eldest of three brothers, Anthony, Thomas, and Andrew. Andrew is a seven-year-old boy born on May 16th of 2013. Ms. Valva has provided developmental, educational, and medical history for the boys and was engaged in providing online education when the boys engaged in therapy for their local public schools and completed this year's coursework while on lockdown due to the coronavirus in June of 2020. The boys have been processing the loss of their brother Thomas, who died on January 17, 2020, and have a highly evolved spirituality, which has assisted in developing coping strategies to address this traumatic loss. This family has a very strong belief involving God and Christianity, and this is a great source of strength for Justina and the boys. Unfortunately, the mother reported that Thomas's grave has been desecrated in recent weeks and that the mother and the boys remain fearful of their father, Angela, and the individuals who took part in abusing them under the leadership of their father and Angela. Anthony, as the eldest, witnessed and experienced the same abuse and neglect that the brothers Thomas and Andrew had suffered and has stated much of the negative effect can be attributed to the sense of helplessness at not being able to assist his brothers. Anthony could not have been of assistance to his brothers as he was being abused and terrorized himself. Anthony has alluded to the abuse and neglect under the care of his father and his fiance Angela and initially reported that he and his brothers were deprived of food, comfort, drinks, a place to sleep, toileting, and that his father and Angela were at all times verbally and physically abusive, calling the boys names and humiliating them, shaming them. Anthony indicated he doesn't know why he was abused by his father and Angela, because they were supposed to love us, but instead they abused us. There's another report dated July 23rd of 2020. The following remarks constitute my report concerning your sons, Anthony and Andrew. So this report is to Justina. Both boys now aged 11 and seven have been in effect the survivors of severe physical and sexual abuse at the hand of their father, Michael Valva, from who you are estranged. Other participants in the abuse include his fiance Angela and several other participants. Mr. Valva and his wife Justina have been involved in divorce proceedings since December of 2015. From September 6, 2017 until January 17, 2020, the three children, Anthony, Thomas, and Andrew, had been residing with their father. An NYPD transit officer and his fiance in the Long Island town of Santo Mauritius. The mother, Justina, had not seen her children for two years, January 14th, 2018, until January 22nd, 2020. After the latter date, she was granted custody of the court by the court of the two remaining children. The father had previously been cruel, verbally and physically, towards his wife and the three sons. The father, his fiance, and other parties had beaten, starved, and tortured the children. They had sexually exploited them, carried out sex trafficking, exposed them to pornography. On the 17th of January, 2020, the father killed the middle boy, forcing all three boys to sleep in a locked and at that time freezing garage and other respects ample and spacious home where he and his fiance and three daughters were living. 
During the cold winter weather, Michael and Angela forced the boys to sleep naked on the concrete, unheated garage. No mattress, no blankets. The father, furthermore, had locked the boys in the garage all during the night, such that they could not enter the main house even to use the bathroom. As a result, Thomas, the middle boy, eight years old, froze to death. Actual voice recordings from the home surveillance system, subsequently released by the district attorney's office, indicated that the father placed his hand over Thomas's mouth and suffocated him. These actions were shown to constitute murder on the part of the father. As a result, Mr. Velva and Miss Polina are being held until their trial for this crime. The murder was the most serious incident in the litany of criminal acts to which the boys were continuously subjected. These include severe beatings, starvation, torture, sexual exploitation and abuse. In addition to such cruelties as not allowing the children to use the toilet for days, the boys were fed once a day, typically just a sandwich. The children were also forced to perform sexual acts. This is another part of this report now that we are going to get into, and I am unsure who this was written by. They would put their fingers in a metal spike in the shape of a cone in the boys' anuses, tremendously hurt their bottoms. The boys were forcefully pulled by their hair, their hands, their feet were tied up with ropes to the bed. The kids were forced to lie down on their bellies or stand up and bend down during their abuse. All three children were beaten, punched, hit by those individuals who were biting the children. Andrew describes more details involving the life with their father and Angela as being abused together with Anthony and Thomas outside of the home. Andrew, however, corroborates Anthony's descriptions of being locked in the freezing garage, naked, deprived of food and water, being made fun of and punished for soiling themselves or having asserted any needs of any manner. Andrew describes being locked out of the refrigerator and compared to Angela's children who seemingly had their needs met in the house. The boys have not discussed any relationship with anyone living in the home of their father. They're trying to process the abuses they suffered from their father and Angela and describe both as verbally and physically abusive at all times. The boys do not seem to have any relationship with Angela's children in their father's home, and the boys perceived that these children had privileges that the boys did not. Angela's children often kept teaching hatred and making false allegations against the boys' mother, instructed by their father and Angela. Anthony and Andrew have a tremendous fear of both their father and Angela. Both boys appear to disassociate or check out to some degree with the mention of their father and Angela. Both children express that they don't want to have any contact with Michael, Angela, or Angela's children. The boys enjoy a very loving and nurturing mother and have been on lockdown due to coronavirus, and this has made it possible for the boys to reestablish a sense of safety, trust, and support in the community. Mother has provided a very structured home and the boys did very well in school over lockdown and have a strong role mo model in their mother, developing coping strategies for the stressors in their lives. So I had to pause there for just a second because before I could read this, I had actually taken two days just to process and um, process the information I'm about to continue and read you. Uh, it's been a lot already, and I'm sure it's been a lot for you guys to listen to. Uh, more so, it was absolute torture for the boys to live through. This is part of a report that was given to Justina and it is a report about what the boys endured. It is much harder to listen to than the things I've already read. So I just wanted to insert editing Tracy here 
to let you know that you should probably tune out if it's something that you can't handle. If everything up to this point has been difficult, this will be much more difficult. So we're going to begin. And this starts uh, mid-sentence. The boys were forced at times to eat hot peppers, vinegar, and even their own feces. Not having, not having been allowed to use the toilet, the boys often had accidents in their diapers. They were forced to wear the diapers even though they had all been potty trained at a very early age by their mother. These now unavoidable accidents became yet another excuse for severe beatings, as well as verbal abuse by the father and his fiancée. The two surviving boys now live with their mother in another Long Island community, Valley Stream. Both have very painful memories of the sadistic behavior that was handed out to them by their father and other participants, as well as disturbing memories of their brother. Anthony mentioned to me an additional form of sadistic behavior they had to endure, namely sexual abuse by their father, Miss Polina, and other predators, who would insert their fingers and at times the cone-shaped spikes in the anuses of one or the other. The father and others would tie them up with ropes and chains. They would be stripped of their clothing, sometimes again only wearing diapers and denied the use of a toilet. In addition, they were warned to shut up and not yell for help. They were warned not to say anything about the abuse to others or otherwise they would face serious injury. During episodes where the boys were being abused sexually, their predators would seal their mouths with duct tape. It has taken a long time for Anthony and Andrew to reveal the abuse they had to endure. Anthony has begun to talk about this form of abuse only recently. This past July, Anthony revealed that he and Thomas at times had been abused sexually by two men and two women who were all wearing black clothing, black shoes, black shirts, the latter adorned with a picture of Satan on one side, skulls and a flame on the other. The children were forced to eat their waste matter in the homes of these abusers, to whose homes their father and Angela would drive them to and deposit them there for varying periods. The group of abusers would strip them naked, tie them with ropes and duct tape, and lock them in cages of jail cells that were either inside the house or the backyard. The cells were small and had no toilets. Besides being starved, the boys would be beaten by these abusers, who used their hands and sometimes a stick. In addition, the abusers would bite the children's bodies and pull their hair, screaming at them and calling them vulgar names. These acts were even recorded on cameras that were hung from the ceiling. Later this past July, the other surviving brother, Andrew, spoke of how the abusers, including their father and Angela, would force the boys to bend down their hands and legs being bound with ropes, whereupon they would have the metal spikes or else shots with a needle in the butt. Despite all the sadistic sexual and physical abuse acts, the authorities made no investigation of the pedophilia perpetrated by the father, Angela, or other participants in these acts. Both boys now have been reunited with their mother and are constantly under her care. With the help of the mater maternal grandmother, they seem to be doing much better. They do both report, however, frightening dreams and nightmares with some regularity in a response to the serious abuse they had earlier suffered at the hands of the aforementioned abusers. The loving relationship between the boys and their mother is clearly evident from the Skype sessions we have had over the past several months. The boys are, thanks to their mother's help, and maternal affections making good recovery from what has befallen them when forced to live with their father and his fiance. Sincerely yours. I have no idea 
what in the world those babies endured. I have no idea how Justina must feel at this point. And in her lawsuit that we've gone over, I can't stress enough how I am rooting for this woman and justice for Thomas. I hope that they allow all of this information into the trial. And I'm going to begin the recordings tomorrow of everything that I do know about the trial thus far. I know that some teachers have broken down and there's been a lot of emotion. People tried, but the system failed. And this time it failed so much that Tommy was lost in it all. I thank you for listening. Make justice for Tommy something that you keep at the forefront of your mind. Join the pages. If there are petitions, sign them. Be sure to be looking out for Justina's lawsuit. Support her and her page in any way that you can. She was ignored once for far too long. We can't let that happen again.